Okay, uh, let's get started. So it's a real privilege to introduce Dr. Rafael Guitardo from The Hutch, uh, where he's a full member of uh, the Vaccine and Infectious Disease Division and Computational Biology Program. He is also an affiliate professor in statistics at the University of Washington. So Rafael uh, hails from France, where long ago he uh, began his studies in applied mathematics, and then he continued training in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and since then, he's really established himself as a leader in the field of computational biology and trying to crack the problem of how you, how you solve and interrogate high-dimensional data sets, uh, both RNA-seq as well as um, polychromatic photometry data. In 2016, uh, he, re he received the 2016 Mitchell Prize from the International Society for Bayesian Anal Analysis uh, in recognition of his group's development of the COMPASS algorithm, which allows uh, interrogation of polyfunctional, which allowed interrogation of polyfunctional T cell subsets and correlation with clinical outcomes. Uh, it's a real privilege to introduce Raphael, and uh, he, uh, it's really been a pleasure to, to talk with him. He's got a real breadth of knowledge and is very conversive, um, and it's been great to have him here. So thanks so much. Great. Thank you, Eric. So can you hear me in the back there? Good. Yeah. So, um, I mean, it's my pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm actually, it's my first time um, in Denver and on this campus, and I'm very impressed to see, you know, all the facilities and, and the, the, the breadth that you have in, in research um, and, and all the people I've talked to this morning. So may, maybe I should start by telling you a little bit about how I got here, where I am today, and the kinds of things that I do. So as Eric said, actually, my background is in statistics. Um, and I've worked a lot in trying to think about how can we use the, basically the training that I have in statistics in understanding new technologies and applying these new technologies in specific contexts, particularly in immunology. And the way that I sort of got there is through flow cytometry. So when I started my career as an assistant professor, I was basically introduced to flow cytometry, and this was 10 years ago. And someone came to me and said, well, you know, we're working these data, and there's really no good tools to look at these things or analyze these kinds of data. People do that manually, and it still is the case today. Um, and at the time when I started to work on this, I was like, well, this sounds great. It sounds like there's lots of opportunities. There's ways to, you know, come up with new ways and helping people to utilize these kinds of data set. And of course, as I got into flow cytometry, I realized there's really lots of cool biological questions that can be answered with these kinds of data. And that sort of brought me into the field of immunology, vaccine research, and a little bit more recently, cancer immunotherapy. So my lab spent a lot of time in trying to work with people in the field of vaccine immunology and cancer immunotherapy and trying to think about new technologies and how can we make sure we've got the best tools possible to analyze these kinds of data that will allow us to address the kinds of questions that we want to address. And we start from you know, really working on the, the um, experiment, the experiment, understanding the experiment, uh, understanding the technology, having tools that really sort of give us the best data possible, pre-processing, normalization, and then having models that allow us to maybe analyze these kinds of data and link that to clinical outcome, potentially. So today, I'll sort of tell you mostly two different stories, some of the work we've been doing in full cytometry um, and the COMPASS algorithm that Eric just mentioned, and some of the work we've been doing in single-cell genomics and single-cell ionoseq. One will be applied to sort of the HIV field, and the other one looking at sort of the tumor micro microenvironment in the context of uh, cancer immunotherapy. So, why do we need to do single cell analysis? Well, I'm sure you all know that, but basically when you look at a tissue sample or blood sample, it's a mixture of all sorts of different cell types, and it's usually a complex mixture of these different cell types. And if you care about real cells, you know, whether you're looking at antigen-specific cells or maybe in the context of minimal residual disease, then if you just do a bulk type experiment, you're going to miss the response you care about because it's going to be matched by all the other larger subsets that are in that sample. Then the other important thing for single cell analysis is that if you want to know if two genes or proteins are co-expressed in a single cell, you have to look at it at the single cell level. If you do a bulk type experiment, you know, RNA-seq, for example, you might sort of learn about co-expression, but all you're going to know is that two genes are sort of co-express on average, but you never truly know if they are co-expressed in the same cell. And that's important for, for defining sort of cellular, cellular quantities that are important in the field of immunology and vaccine research, such as polyfunctionality. 
if you look at T cells that produce multiple cytokines, these effector molecules, they tend to be linked to better clinical outcomes. So this is really important for defining these kinds of uh, functionality profile. The reason why you know, people have been um, doing more and more single cell analysis, it's obviously because it's really important, but it's also because there's been a revolution in the kinds of platforms that you can use for um, doing single cell analysis. You still have sort of your sort of high dimensional, high throughput flow cytometer. This is actually the new SBD instrument, the FAC Symphony, which is not um, as limited as your typical flow cytometer. You can go up to 30 to 40 markers in principle at least. Um, and we have three instruments at the hatch, and we've been working on panels with 27 colors. Then you have CYTOF, which is basically very similar, but you don't use uh, fluorocal markers, so you don't have the issue of uh, spectral overlap. And in principle, you can even go beyond and do 40 to 50 markers, looking at uh, integrating uh, 40 to 50 proteins in single cells. And then you have the new sort of area of single cell genomics, whether you're looking at multiplex qPCR or maybe uh, doing single cell on the C1 or 10x. The key point here is that we've got all these great technologies, but they all have the same issues, is that, you know, as you know, when you have these technologies that generate large data set, you know, they can be very sensitive to changes in the SOP, um, you know, the environment, who runs the, the, the experiment, and then you have large data sets, and, and you have lots of complex questions trying to understand technical versus biological variation, and trying to think about what's the best way to analyze these kinds of data. And so this is where we come in and try to really help in um, thinking about the best way to do that and leveraging these technologies. One of the things that we've been using these technologies for with collaborators at the Hutch and other places in really trying to look at T cells and understand T cell diversity and link that to clinical outcome, whether we're looking at it in the context of engine-specific T cells or maybe CAR T cells or generally speaking T cells. So T cells are extremely diverse. They have you know, diverse, di diversity in terms of the, the um, genomic aspects, so TCR sequence, but also diversity in terms of the function. So even two uh, T cells with the same TCR sequence might be very different functionally depending on maybe the environment, the tissue they're in, uh, the other cells that are around, or maybe um, the, the time and, and other co-infections. So there's a lot of things that will impact functionality of these T cells. And so it's very critical to use single cell technologies to be able to understand T cell diversity and link that to the outcomes of interest. So the key point that I like to make here is when we study antigen-specific T cells is that not all these cells are created equal. So it's not because you've, you've had lots of T cells that might be specific to um, HIV or flu that you'll necessarily be protected or have a better disease outcome. In fact, there's lots of things that are important in terms of the T cells linked to the quality of these T cells. So again, thinking of it that it's not necessarily the quantity of antigen-specific T cells that matters, but the quality of these T cells. So you want to have the right, the, the right kind of T cells that will basically protect you um, against the, the diseases. And, and one of the things I mentioned is the polyfunctionality, and I'll come back to that. So I'll use a motivating example, so something we've been um, analyzing over you know, the past five years, and this is through what's called the RV144 efficacy trial. This is the first HIV vaccine to have shown uh, efficacy in humans. It was pretty modest, was around 30%. But because this was more or less the first successful study in the vaccine context, people were very excited about this. And there were a lot of studies that were done in trying to understand, okay, what did the vaccine actually do in terms of um, stimulating immune responses that could be linked to that decreased risk of infection? Because if we understand that, then maybe we'll, um, that will help us to better understand future vaccines, maybe down-select down future vaccine regimens, and maybe improve future uh, vaccine. Um, and, and that in the context of HIV, but other infectious diseases potentially. So there was basically a correlate study that was done as part of this where um, there's a group of us at the Hatch who work with lots of different labs in trying to understand and profile the immune responses after vaccination and link that to infection status. There was actually lots of different groups that were interested in generating data. So there was actually a huge down selection process that was done where people generated data. We looked at the data. Um, and these were blinded data, not looking at the case control status, just doing immunogenicity, looking at the reproducibility, whether the, um, there was correlation among the assays and trying to select a minimum set of variables that we wanted to use for the case control study. So I'm not going to talk too much about that, but the key point is that there were six variables that were down-selected 
for the primary analysis of the case control study. So six uh, variables measuring vaccine immune responses that were then correlated with um, infection status in the trial. Five were antibody function, and one was cellular function, only looking at CD4 T cell responses. So vaccine-specific CD4 T cell responses. The, the, the key point of that um, correlate study is that um, there were actually no T cell correlates, so the CD4 T cell function that were measured were not correlated with uh, infection status with an increase or decreased risk of infection, and two of the antibody function were actually correlated. So when we looked at that, we thought, well, this is unfortunate because, you know, first of all, if there's antibody function that's important, we think that T cell probably played a role because T cells can help. And so we think maybe we could sort of try to realize this data. And specifically, since they actually use an ICX experiment that was sort of already sort of high dimensional, where they profiled six different cytokines, so we had six functions, but the primary variable that was defined in that correlate study was just looking at the magnitude of the response. So just looking at how many cells do you have that respond to uh, the stimulation that produce any one of these cytokines. Actually, it was any four in this case, but it's almost the same thing. So maybe I thought I would sort of go over that ICS experiment for those of you who are not very familiar with it to try to understand what we're trying to do. So in an, in an ICS experiment, what you do usually is basically you take someone's uh, blood sample and then you stimulate it with peptides that basically match the vaccine insert. And the idea is that the cell that responds to the stimulation will produce cytokines in response. So one way to quantify the amount of response or the amount of vaccine-specific T cells that you have in someone's uh, BBMC is you just stimulate them, you look at the cytokine response, and you can basically just enumerate how many cells respond. So this just gives you the, the magnitude. But in fact, we measure all sorts of different functions as well. So you can look at the magnitude of cells that produce interferon gamma, uh, 2, TF, TNF alpha, and so forth. There may be combinations of those. And there's actually a process that goes through that where you first need to gate your cells. So you bas basically look at these sort of 2D scatter plots to identify the cells of interest. So you have the intensity for CD4, CD8. So you can look at your CD4 cells and then your CD8 cells, and then you will look at the cytokine expression, and you draw basically boundaries on where you think there's positive expression. And we've done lots of work on this area that I'm not really going to talk about in trying to identify these populations and how to do that. But what I'm going to talk about mostly today is once we've identified these cells that produce different cytokine functions, how do we analyze these kinds of data? So, whoop. sorry about that. Okay. And I don't know why it's doing this. Okay. You know, I gave a talk. Um, in uh, Colorado last summer, and the same thing happened, so it's got to be something with the, <laughs> the, you know, I don't know, people just mess with me in Colorado or something. Uh, Did you tune your computer to altitude? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was almost going to check, actually. So. Um, that, that might be it. Oh, boy. Uh, let me just try something. <laughs> Maybe there's a, I don't know, setup that I did here or something. You know what? I'll try to unplug the remote and see if that helps. We'll see if that does something. You know, last time I gave the, the talk here, I was thinking maybe there's someone in the room that has a remote that's just messing with me and just clicking, you know. But um, Okay. So, boy, that's doing it again. So. Let me just kill PowerPoint and see if that does it better. And I'm a computational guy, so you think I'd be good with computers. But... So I'm going to um, continue and see how that goes. It's doing it again. <laughs> 
Okay. Let's see. I don't know what's doing that. So we, we spend a lot of time in trying to, you know, think about ways to analyze the data, basically going from, from here. Um, I guess I still have to put that on. From, you know, going from here to these counts. And, and this is really how I get in the field originally, trying to think about um, tools that can be used to do that. Boy. You know what? I'm going to do something else. I'm going to export it and just open it with something else. We'll do an old school PDF and, okay. Okay. I apologize. Oh, you're not seeing it. Hold on, I'll do this. <laughs> okay, let's try that. Okay. I'll just do that. So, um, so we, we spend a lot of time in trying to think about basically tools to analyze these kinds of data, and, and we've, we've built a complete pipeline in R. So the, 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 the thing is that there's always been lots of work in the field of genomics, but there's never really been a lot of work in trying to understand you know, flow cytometry and having infrastructure for reading the files, visualizing data, and doing things in R. So we've built a complete pipeline in R to do that. And in particular, we've, we've built two tools that we think would be useful that I wanted to mention. Um, one is called OpenSIDO for doing automated gating, and I'll show you a couple of examples of things we've done. And the other one that I'll talk about, which is Compass for looking at polyfunctionality that has been extremely useful uh, in the context of vaccination. So OpenSIDO is basically a framework, so if you think about you know, ways to build pipeline for doing automated gating, that's something we wanted to do. And there's a couple of reasons why we wanted to do that. One is because we work a lot on clinical trials where we need things to be sort of robust, standardized, and define um, and lead to well-defined populations that we can use at endpoint, as endpoints in these trials. And the other one is that we've realized across, you know, over the years that people have built tools for doing these kinds of things, but sometimes depending on the data set you're looking at, whether you're looking at maybe lymphocytes or T cells or you have different kinds of distributions, you probably want to use and combine different algorithms. And that's one of the reasons why we wanted to do that, so that we can basically um, use different algorithms across the pipeline in analyzing these data. The other thing that we do is that we work on a lot of uh, very large clinical trials where we have basically gigabytes, sometimes you know, close to one terabyte of data set. If you think of a trial where you have 500 people, you might have three different stimulations, negative control, you might have different time points. That adds up pretty quickly. And you have single cell data where you have millions of cells. And so we wanted to have something that can scale up where we can really still analyze very large data sets and we have something built around something called Edge JFI, which is a file-based format, where we basically just read the data we need to read in memory to do the analysis. And that has been very useful as well. So, um, and I apologize for the quality, but this is just through, during the export. This is just to show you how that compares if we were to do sort of manual analysis, which is basically defining these, popul these populations. So tip this is a typical sort of T-cell experiment where what you do is that you look at these 2D scatter plots, so side scattered and forward scattered. You identify basically your siglets, removing all the doublets. Then you look at your lymphocyte gate. Then you look at um, all the life cells and then the lymphocytes. And then you identify your CD4s and your CD8. And then you look at basically the cytokine expression. So on the left hand side, you will see basically the, I have to remember which one's which, um, the, the automated algorithm and the manual algorithm. And, we can see, and you can see it's actually the other around, manual on left and, and automated on the right. And we can match the, the gating procedure pretty well, and this is important for um, basically clinical trials where we want to have things that are well-defined. 
And you can use more than two dimensions at once. You can do things that are a little bit more exploratory, and that's important for Saito, for example. And we've got ways to do that, too. So how do we know that we're doing pretty well? And this is important, again, thinking about validation, so we can look at sensitivity and accuracy. So sensitivity is, do we detect what we care about? Do we really see these antigen-specific responses? So on the, the y-axis, you see basically the magnitude of the vaccine-specific um, T cells. And on the y-axis is just the different subsets. So we label the subsets. You've got the CD4s, CD8, and then you have the functional profiles. And what you can see, there's the two colors. For, there's the manual the, and the uh, automated. And you can see that the magnitude of the response we detect is very comparable to the automated. We see good response um, in response to the simulation. So certainly, in this case, it was a lot of poor responses. And then we, we compare the accuracy, looking at the magnitude. Um, you know, doing the manual gating uh, frequencies against the automated, we get pretty good concordance between the two, which shows that, you know, it is accurate and it's do go doing a pretty good job. But that saves a lot of time because you don't have to do it manually. You can just do it very efficiently this way. Now we work with lots of people at the Fred Hutch that, you know, really care about standardization. And we had another, uh, um, and it's particularly even standardization across centers. So we have another study that was funded by the Human Immunology Project Consortium, where we basically looked at, you know, how is uh, how important is gating when you look at data across multiple centers, and this is what we've done here, where we basically um, profile um, different. So we, we worked with um, lots of different centers, and we had really standardized um, SOPs where we use standardized regions, lyophilized regions. Then we send you know, everything that, was the, the, that the people were supposed to do to analyze these data. And then we basically um, compare the results of their analysis. And what we realized is that there was a huge amount of variation that was due mostly on how the people analyzed the data, so due to the gating and not really on how they generated the data. However, if you were to combine all the files together and do a central analysis, you could significantly reduce the variability. Of course, that's not really what people do in practice. But if you do something that's computational, you don't have to do that. You can just analyze everything through the same algorithm, which is what we've done here, and we've shown that we can get comparable, comparable results. So this was another, um, basically, um, um, piece of data that showed that these automated algorithms that can do pretty well. The other thing that some people ask me today about, oh, well, we use Flojo. How can we use your tools? Well, we also work with a lot of people who use these commercial platforms, such as Flojo, Saturbank, Diva, and others. And sometimes they tell us, well, I'd like to look at the results in my favorite tool. So we've worked a lot in trying to reverse engineer their file format so that we can export to their file format or we can import their file format. So this is the results of analysis um, done in Flojo that we imported in R. Then this is the result of an analysis we did in R and exported to Flojo. And this is the same with Shadowbank. In fact, we collaborate a lot with them, and they use some of our tools for doing the import um, in Shadowbank, for example. So this is really good because you can do these kinds of things and then look at it in your favorite tool. Okay, so this is what this was just sort of a side story telling you a bit and giving you some references about some of the things that we've done. What I want to show you is, is that sort of polyfunctionality analysis that I was talking about with that compass algorithm. So I assume that we've basically gated the data, and now I have counts that tells me how many cells you know, um, are positive for R2 alone, how many cells are positive for R2 in different gamma, and so on and so forth. So looking at all the different Boolean combinations of functions that we see, and that's what I call by that sort of a, um, a Boolean matrix, and we have one matrix for the stimulated sample and one matrix for the instimulated sample, and we have these matrices for each subject. And the idea then is to see, well, what are the functional profiles that I observe uh, in response to the simulation, maybe across individuals or maybe some that are unique in specific subsets of these individuals, because these maybe will be the ones that are important that will be linked to the clinical outcome of interest. So I'm going to come back to the analysis of that RV144 clinical trial where basically we thought, well, wait a minute. All they looked at in this trial was just the magnitude, so how many cells basically respond to any of the cytokines. But they didn't really look at the functional profiles, looking at all the different Boolean combinations. The disadvantage when you do that, when you have only six cytokines or six functions in this case, you have already 64 subsets. 
And these are pretty rare responses, right? It's maybe if you get 500 antigen-specific cells um, that are vaccine-specific, you're lucky. So think about, you know, slicing these data into 64 possible different subsets. You're going to get very small counts. And if you know a little bit about statistics, when you have small counts, it makes it very hard to have statistical power because you don't know if what you're seeing is real or if it's just due to background noise, for example. However, at this trial, we have lots of different subjects. We had actually 262 subjects. So we could bore strength across all of the different subjects in knowing if the response that I'm seeing is real or is just due to background noise. Basically, if I see five cells that make out to an ATF from gamma in one subject, I'm going to say, well, is this really real or is this just, you know, near the limit of detection of the assay. But if I see five cells, five to 10 cells in maybe 262 subjects, I'm gonna be thinking that this is probably more real. It's not just random noise. And this is what we've done with the COMPASS algorithm, which is something called a Bayesian framework where we can borrow strength, borrow information across multiple subjects. So the reason we wanted to do that is to be able to model all the different Boolean combinations and then potentially define scores, polyfunctionality score, that will tell me, is, uh, does this subject have a high polyfunctional T cell response that are vaccine specific? Does this subject have a high polyfunctional so on and so forth? And then define these scores that we can correlate with the outcomes of interest. And I'll tell you a little bit on how we do that. So I'm going to, you know, show you the results of this data set where we had these 262 subjects. In fact, this was a mix of the case control, and we had a few placebos because this was used for the calibration of the assay, making sure there was nothing wrong. And in fact, the, the placebos have very low response, so we're very confident what we're seeing is real there. Um, we had basically the one stimulation with AMV, which is the envelope protein of the HIV virus, and the unstimulated con control. Six functional markers, 64 possible combinations, but in fact, many of those are empty, so it turns out that if you look at maybe a specific uh, functional profile, you're never going to see cells that co-produce these uh, functions, and so you can just eliminate those. So we ended up with 15 uh, combinations that we model. So this is the heat map of the response. So basically, for each functional profile or for each combination of function in a given subject, the algorithm will tell you, do I see a response or do I see cells that respond to stimulation that co-produce these multiple functions? Um, and if it does, then you get a probability of one, which is basically blue here. And if you don't, you get a zero. So here in this heat map, you've got the subjects as rows and the function or the subset as columns. So these are cells that only produce R17. These are cells that only produce R4. These are cells that are only positive for CD4 D ligand, and so on and so forth. And these are cells that will be positive for R4, TNF, interferon gamma, R2, and CD4 D ligand. So what you see is that there's a lot of response, right? Generally speaking, it was pretty immunogenic. There's a lot of CD4 response. And by the way, here I'm only looking at CD4 because there was no CD8 response in that vaccine. Um, but if you look at, uh, for example, R2 and CD4 ligand, which is, you know, sort of what most people would look at, certainly R2, you will see that almost everyone's responding, you know, respective of, of whether they were infected or non-infected later on in the trial. However, if you start looking at these higher polyfunctionality, you will see that the non-infected tend to have sort of a higher response of polyfunctional T cells than the infected. So you sort of see where that's going. It seems to be that there is a polyfunctionality response there. Now, because we are looking at these um, 15 different subsets, there's still a lot of variables. And we don't want to have to test each of these single variable because, as you know, when you test lots of different things, you have to pay a price for multiple testing. There's a penalty. And then that sort of decreases your significance. So we wanted to be able to combine these different responses into maybe one or two scores that combine these. And we defined two scores, one that we call the functionality score, which basically just um, for a given subject looks at how many subsets, how many positive responses do I see across the different subsets. So here you take a subject, you say, okay, I see one, so it's one plus one plus one plus one, and so on and so forth. And that's the functionality score, just the number of functions you observe. The polyfunctionality score is similar, except that you're going to weight it by the degree of functionality. So, for example, here, 
that you will just add one because it's degree one. Here you will add two because it's degree two, and so on and so forth. So you just weight it by the degree of functionality. The idea is that you want to give more weight to subsets or responses across highly polyfunctional subsets because we know this is probably more important. So now when we looked at these scores and we correlate that with infection status in the trial, just in the same way that it was done in the primary analysis, what we see is that people who were non-infected tended to have higher poly poly uh, functionality and polyfunctionality score. And here you see that in particular the polyfunctionality score is much higher in the non-infected subjects than in the infected, which sort of agrees with what people have shown in the past, that polyfunctionality is good, and if you have a high polyfunctionality, uh, response in the T cell after vaccination, you tend to have a decreased risk of infection. So this was great because it showed that by reanalyzing the data, thinking about a new tool to analyze these kinds of data, we could detect a correlate of, of risk in this trial that would have been missed otherwise. Now we, yeah, and we've applied this tool in lots of different contexts, um, you know, other diseases and so forth. Um, of course, when you work in HIV, there's not a whole lot of efficacy trials because, first of all, you need to have a vaccine that you think is a good candidate, and these are very expensive. But we're lucky to be involved in another efficacy trial of H HVTN505, which, in fact, is a vaccine that had no efficacy, but people were still interested in looking at it and thinking, well, maybe there's a response there, maybe in a subgroup of, of individuals where maybe we see an increase or decreased risk of infection, potentially. So we analyzed um, the, the ICS data set from this trial, which was very similar, looking at slightly different functions, but still six functions. And in this case, there were actually CD4 and CD8 responses. So in the CD4 responses, and here we, I'm showing you also the placebo responses, so you can see that the placebos have sort of have low scores compared to the vaccinees. Uh, so this is CD4, CD8, placebo, vaccinees, and then you have the non-infected and the infected. And again, you, you see a trend for CD4s, though it's not statistically significant, but there's really a lot of signal in the CD8s that people who had a higher polyfunctional CD8 response were less likely to become infected after vaccination. So even though there was no efficacy overall, there seems to be uh, um, um, evidence that showed that CD8 T cell response was important in controlling infection. So again, this was sort of a nice validation for the tool that, that we've worked on. Um, and, and as I said, it's been, you know, we're using Compass throughout, and we're really helping out people you know, in lots of other fields and diseases applying this tool for looking at uh, responses to vaccination. Also looking at it in the context of immunotherapy and looking at cow T cell responses, for example. Okay, so I'm going to um, switch to uh, my second story, where basically we're going to look at single cell genomics. So flow cytometry, Cytof, these are great technology because they are you know, extremely high throughput, um, they are, I would say, not too expensive. You can, you know, profile lots of subjects. They're pretty well standardized. The one disadvantage, obviously, is that you're still limited by the number of things you can measure, whether you're doing that on Cytof or flow cytometry. And then you're limited by the antibodies that you have. If you don't have a good antibody for the protein that you care about, you're just not going to be able to, to uh, quantify that protein. So this is why people have started to look at single cell genomics. So instead of looking at protein, you look at RNA. Of course, you know, we would prefer to look at protein, but RNA is still a good proxy for it, and we don't have to have antibodies for those. The disadvantage, of course, is that it's more expensive, and um, it's not as high throughput, but you, it's getting there where you can get sort of higher and higher throughput. So what we've been doing in particular, because for the most part, not always, but often we look at antigen-specific cells, we first have to enrich for those, because otherwise you would miss the response. You know, think about the fact that if you take a million PBMCs, maybe you have 500 antigen-specific cells in those. If you were just to profile everything or randomly select 10,000 cells, you're probably not going to get any antigen-specific cells. So you can solve those maybe by looking at CD40 ligand, you know, you stimulate the cells with peptides, you look at uh, CD40 ligand or CD107A uh, for looking at CD8s, and then you sort, and then you do um, maybe a multiplex PCR, which we've done a lot, or you do something on the fluid MC1, or you sort in 96 well plate, and you do sort in SmartSeq2. On the other hand, if you're looking at maybe sort of a larger sample, you just want to get a sense of the constitution of that sample, you don't care about two rare cell subsets, then you can just do 10x, where you can go to up to 
50 or 100,000 cells. In fact, 10X just had an experiment where they generated over a million cells um, looking at neuron cells. So when we started to work on this, and this was really looking at multiplex qPCR, and this was already six years ago, so I think we were, you know, the first group to look at multiplex qPCR and thinking about the statistical issues involved in the analysis of, of these data. The first thing we've observed is what I would call the bimodality. So there's something very special about gene expression at the single cell level where you get that burst of expression. So you will have cells that, or genes in cells that are, on, you know, in a sort of quiescent state, you get almost no expression, so undetectable, zero. And then all of a sudden, there's a large expression. So you get truly bimodality, where you get something that's zero, or you get something that's highly positive. And there's really a big gap in between. I'll show you some data. Then, of course, as with any other new technology, there were a lot of issues. You know, uh, the capture rate was pretty low. We get poor quality data. Sometimes we had cells that were misbehaved. You could have maybe doublets and things we had to take out. So we spent a lot of time understanding the technique, QC, and so forth. And then, of course, we get large data sets. So we have to think about how do we handle these kinds of data. And we're thinking, you know, we're thinking about that very hard, especially now we can get, you know, 100,000 cells, 30,000 genes. That gives you a huge amount of data that's actually very hard to read in memory. So this is an example of a multiplex qPCR experiment um, where uh, this is actually a collaboration with J.P. Pantaleo in Lausanne where we looked at TFA cells in lymph nodes, T follicular helper cells. And this is just to show you the expression of BCL6, which is actually a canonical transcription factor for TFH cells. And what you see is that there's really high expression, right, um, in many of the cells, but some cells do not express BCL6 at all. And you get that sort of bimodality. It's not because, you know, and it's not really that you have sort of a continuum. You really have zero or something that's much higher. And then if you look at single cell anti-seq, you will see the same thing. You see bimodality of expression. If you look at these, these are two data sets looking at dendritic cells. This is um, Alex Schellek at the Broad Institute, one of the first papers looking at that, where they also used our tool for bimodality modeling. Or we looked also at made cells with Martin Prilich, um, and we also see bimodality there. So... We've spent a lot of time in trying to understand the technique. How do you analyze these kinds of data? How do you account for these kinds of bimodality? And we've come up with models to account for that. So we had basically a series of papers where we started first with um, this one looking at the multiplex QPCR. So this was one of the first papers where we looked at the bimodality. It's actually kind of interesting because we were really the first group to look at that in the multiplex QPCR uh, platform. And uh, people don't necessarily know about it in the single cell anesthetic field. Some people know about it, but some people never looked at it because it was, we were looking at multiplex qPCR. But in fact, many of the challenges are kind of similar because of that bimodality. And then we've uh, basically adapted that where we collaborated with Nanostring. So, and I'll tell you a little story about that. But basically, Nanostring is a biotech company in Seattle that was started in Seattle. And they were interested in maybe moving in that space, and since then they've decided not to for, you know, obvious reasons because there's a lot of competition. But they had a, a cool, interesting project, and they came to us, and they asked us how to analyze the data they had generated. And so we had to think about how to look at the effect of cell cycle, and I'll tell you about that. But basically, we've sort of um, improved and generalized the tool so that it can be used on their data. And then they, we basically expanded that looking at RNA-seq as well. So through that, we've built a... a what I think is a very good R package, which we call MAST, which allows you to do lots of things, sort of QC of single cells. Um, um, it has that sort of semi-continuous uh, model, model so that we can really account for the fact that you get the zero inflation. Uh, we can do gene set enrichment analysis. It's pretty fast, and it, it's, um, it works on the different platforms, whether you're doing you know, multiplex QPCR, nanostring, or RNA-seq. And there's an R package that's fully available. It's actually part of Bioconductor, so I'm giving you the GitHub repo, but it's part of Bioconductor as well. And I was just looking at it because there's been a variety of, of uh, papers that have been published um, recently, probably over the past six months, looking at how do these methods for doing differential expression in single-cell RNA-seq experiment compare, and MASS actually does pretty well. Um, it's usually, I wouldn't say it's the best one, but it's usually... Um, among the top five, and, and if you can for speed and everything, I would say it's probably one of the best. So we're happy to see that. 
So here I'm going to tell you that story about nano, that nanostring collaboration that we had, where we basically, they came to us, they said, we think we have a, a good way to, to, to profile more genes than our competitors, which was Fluidam at the time. They can do 96. We can multiplex up to 800. So we think what would be cool is to um, um, profile cell cycle genes so that we can correct for cell cycle. Because as you know, in single cells, you know, the cells might be in different phases of the cell cycle. And maybe that impacts uh, gene expression. So this was the idea. And um, they generated data, 800 cells across three different cell lines, different phases of the cell cycle. And they said, can you help us sort of come up with a model that would predict cell cycle based on gene expression? The short answer is that we couldn't do it. There was signal. We could do pretty well. But I don't think we could do anything better than 70% accuracy. So there seems to be you know, lots of variability, which could have been partly technical and partly biological. The, the second thing that we looked at is that they had put cell cycle genes, so as part of their, um, their marker, the, the panel that they had designed, they had genes that were known to be previously associated with cell cycle, basically based on um, bulk experiments, and for example, looking at cycle base, and genes that were not known to be associated with cell cycle, and these are, were mostly immune genes. So these are the genes that were not cell cycle associated. These are the genes that were previously shown to be associated with cell cycle. And here, with our model, we can test, is that gene, you know, um, does that gene vary with cell cycle? And we use a model to do that. And this is basically minus 10 log 10 p value. So the higher, the more significant the gene is. Lots of significant in the red group, not so much in the blue group, which tells you that cell cycle doesn't have or doesn't appear to have a huge effect on non-cell cycle genes in this data set. So we published that story, and that sort of ended that collaboration because there didn't seem to be a lot of, of things we could do um, based on the idea. Now what's interesting, and, and at the time upsetting, is that someone published a paper very similar to ours, I believe a few months later, um, which in fact they didn't cite our paper, but when I looked at the paper originally, it was published just two weeks after, but ours would have been available during the revision of that paper. And I was a little bit upset because they, you know, first of all, they didn't cite a paper, even, even though it was very similar, but also because the conclusions seemed to be very different. So this paper was looking at a method to correct for cell cycle, and they're saying, Cell cycle is everywhere. There's a huge effect. They was doing single cell ionic seq And one of the, you know, to quote the paper, it says, cell cycle variation affects global gene expression. And so when I saw that, I was like, well, that's sort of strange, because that's not really what we see. So I asked Andrew McDavid, who was my student at the time, who, who was the first author on the previous paper, to reanalyze this data. So what we found is that basically, in the paper, they have a technique to estimate cell cycle effect for each cell. And that's the, um, the estimated cell cycle effect. And then they use that to reg regress that out and remove that effect. Now, if we plot the estimated cell cycle effect against the sequencing depth, we see that there's almost a, basically a correlation of one, almost. So their estimate of cell cycle effect was just basically pure technical bias due to sequencing depth. And w the reason why they did not um, properly normalized the data is because they use spiking controls to normalize the data, which have been shown to be totally unreliable in bulk RNA-seq and probably even more so in single cell RNA-seq. So the bottom line here is that you have to be very careful in how you analyze their data. There was a lot of things that were wrong, so there were improper normalization. There was also poor experimental design because they were using one C1 chip for one phase, one C1 chip for the other phase. So basically the chip effect was totally confronted with cell cycle effect. So, you know, the, the, the story here is that you have to be careful in how you analyze data, think about experimental design, think about how you, um, you analyze the data. And these, you know, the people who published that paper, they are leaders in the field of single cell and seq and I have lots of respect for them. I think they're very good, but they really um, had limitations in this study. Okay, so, you know, I think I'm, I hope I convinced you that thinking about sort of, uh, Technical aspects and methods is important, you know, collaborating with people who understand, you know, the, the variation of these kinds of data, whether it's technical or biological, and I have the proper expertise to analyze this data. So I'm going to finish with a story that I think you'll find interesting. This is very new data. This is unpublished data, where we basically use single cell seq to try to understand why a given patient seemed to respond originally to immunotherapy, but then failed. So this is looking at Merkel cell carcinoma, um, so this is a very um, aggressive uh, skin cancer. It's not super common, but it's very aggressive, much more aggressive than melanoma. The interesting about MCC is that 
um, it's, the, in, it's actually, in 80% of the cases, it's caused by a virus, the Merkel cell uh, poliomyelitis. So what's great, it makes it a very good target for immunotherapy because in these uh, MCCs, you will have expression of um, the oncoproteins, um, and therefore you can use that as a target for immunotherapy. So this is actually the patient that, that we'll be using here, and this is the course of the therapy. So this was actually a combination of T-cell therapy and anti-PD-1 and anti-CDL4. And this is basically what we're showing you is um, the treatment, the time from treatment to basically stop of treatment. And this is unfortunate, but this is when the patient died. So you can see this is, on the wax is the disease burden, and you can see there's nice progression of the disease, even after anti-PD-1, which basically these, um, these people respond very well to anti-PD-1, and it's been approved as a therapy now, but not everyone responds to anti-PD-1. So what you see is that there's still progression, and there's the T-cell therapy that's combined with anti-PD-1, later anti-CD4, and what you see is that there's a nice response where there's a significant decrease but then there's a relapse. And um, what we wanted to see is trying to understand why these patients seem to respond at first, but then relapse. Was it due mostly maybe because of the T-cell therapy, even though we can see a lot of um, MCPY um, antigen-specific T-cells there? So we, in collaboration with basically Ocha Pui at the FEDH and, and Paul Niem, we basically looked at these samples and trying to use single cell INSIC. So we had two, two things we looked at. We looked at blood samples. We had four different PBMC samples during the course of the treatment, one at the very early time, then basically um, at the start of the response, during response, and then after uh, relapse. This is just doing, for those who, I mean, I'm sure many of you have seen these types of plot. It's called basically a TISNI plot, where basically it's a dimension reduction where you take your single cell INA-seq, um, and then project all the gene expression into two components, Disney 1 and Disney 2, which allows you to visualize this data in a two-dimensional space. And what you will see is that cells there that share, the, that are similar in terms of the transcriptional profile would be closer to one another on that two-dimensional projection. Here what I'm showing you is just basically the clustering by um, the different processing time. And what we wanted to show you is that there doesn't seem to be obvious clustering by time which we didn't really want to happen because this will be indicative of maybe batch effect or, or um, bias due to the cell processing. What's nice is that we get nice overlap of the different populations that we'll get onto across a different time point. So by looking, and this, here we use a package called CERAD for doing the clustering and then looking at uh, expressions of, of key genes, we can sort of give a, a label, a phenotype to these different sort of clusters of cell types that we see. So, um, you know, what's nice is that you see lots of different cells. You can basically find your uh, T cells are all the ones that will be CD3 positive. And then maybe if you look at the CD8 positive T cells, you will get here. Um, you can also look at your B cells by looking at the ones that are CD19, CD20 positive, and so on and so forth. So you can basically look at the cells and label the cells in this plot. And that's how we basically did it here. Now what we wanted to see is how does that change over time? So we basically collapsed the first two early time points that were very similar, and then looked at the time of the response, and then um, after um, relapse. And what you see is that what's changing a lot is the cells here, which is basically that CD8 effector cluster and we can see there's the huge, um, or there's much higher frequency of the CD8 effector T cells during the response and then sort of decrease. So there was a good, you know, CD8 response. So we know that the CD8 response, which is basically the T cell therapy, played a very important role in the response there. And we actually still see some of these cells after relapse. So we're sort of wondering, you know, maybe it's not due to the actual T cells potentially. Now we also had paired samples, so we had two um, tumor samples, one before uh, therapy and one after therapy. And I'm showing you the same plot here, and um, uh, we've color, um, colored the cells by whether they're coming from the before or the after. So these are all the cells in blue coming from before, all the cells are coming from after. What you see here is that you see a clear clustering by before, after. <clears throat> 
right? But you only see it for the tumor cells, and I'll show you that after. What's nice is that you see nice overlap with the other sort of uh, your macrophages, your lymphocytes, fibroblasts. You see cells from before and after that nicely overlap. So this tells us that it's not just a processing effect. There's true biology that's driving the differences in these tumor cells before and after. And uh, this is just to tell you how we label those. Again, very similar by looking at uh, either tumor markers or you know, canonical sort of uh, um, genes for the different other cells that we've labeled there. And you know, because we're doing RNA-seq, you can even look at expressions of uh, viral proteins. So we align to the human genome, but also to the MCC genome. And there you would see that there's actually nice expression of the viral genes in many of these cells. It's about 11%, I think, overall here, which tells us that maybe you know, the, the expression of the viral gene is slightly below the, you know, because it's shallow sequencing, so it may not detect expression of, of all the the viral genome, but we can still detect those, and there doesn't seem to be obvious differences before or after. Now, if we look at um, something I didn't say, but the T-cell therapy was actually um, uh, targeting HLA-B. So if you, see, if you look at HLA-E, you don't really see any difference before and after therapy, but if you look at HLA-B, you see a huge downregulation of HLA-B. So this is clear evidence that the tumor basically escaped uh, the T cell pressure by downregulating HLAB. And this is something that would have been possible to see if we hadn't done single cell RNA seq here. And this is highly significant if we were to use a mass firmware for looking at differential gene expression. Now, we also looked at all sorts of other genes that were differentially expressed in the tumor cells before and after. And what we find is that there's another one that was kind of interesting is the HLAE. So there was actually then an upregulation of HLAE. And this is kind of interesting because we knew that the patient did not, did not respond to NK cell therapy boosting um, after relapse, and HLA-B can block um, NK cells. Um, and so this was really consistent with what we're seeing, again, um, in the clinical response. Okay, so um, I, I hope I've convinced you that single cell NHC in this context, which was very targeted, focused on one single patient, um, looking at why we're getting sort of a, a relapse, which is probably just because the tumor cells and, and have sort of basically escaped the, um, the, the T cell therapy by basically uh, downregulating HLAB and then upregulating HLAE. So this is really the perfect example of how single cell RNA seq is critical. And these findings couldn't be done by traditional flow cytometry. We couldn't see that CD8 effector cluster that I showed you using sort of a limited uh, um, panel uh, for flow cytometry. And the, the HLA, A, B, and E couldn't really be detected by um, histochemistry either. So I'll, I'll um, just stop here and just mention a few things briefly. A um, couple of things we're thinking about as well is then how can we combine, maybe if we look at these T-cell these, um, T therapies, can we also look at TCR? And we have TCR data on some of the, on this patient, um, but this was mostly looking at adaptive sequencing, and this was, wasn't paired at the single cell level. So um, 10X Genomics has a new kit now that allows you to pair TCR with function at the single cell level, and we're actually better testing that test for them, that kit for them. And there's lots of things that you can do now that I haven't really talked about, looking at the epigenomics. So, uh, for example, doing single cell attack seq that might also provide additional data for understanding sort of cellular heterogeneity and linking that to important clinical outcome. Um, so lots of people who contributed to this work, in particular, um, Greg Finak in my lab, who's done lots of work on the compass algorithm and all the flow cytometry, and Valentine Welly, who's done all the work on the Merkel cell uh, experiment and other things we've been working on, and obviously the funding. So I'll stop here and take questions. Yes, a lot of uh, count, uh, one, uh, how do you decide whether uh, 
Yeah, so, I mean, it's a good question. There's been lots of work in that space in trying to think about what's the right parametric model, whether you use a negative binomial, a zero inflated negative binomial. We actually, for single cell anisic, we use a zero inflated log normal model. And the reason is because it's more, well, the, the main reason is because we started with multiplex QPCR, where, where there it wasn't counts. It was, you know, um, basically expression values that we're getting, so it was continuous. Actually, so how that uh, zero inflated uh, phenomenon is related to the bimodality of the patient? Yeah, so the bimodality is driven by two things, probably technical variation in the sense that some, you know, because there's a lot of amplification that goes through because you don't have a lot of RNA from single cells. So sometimes maybe, you know, there's, the amplification doesn't work very well and you're just below the limit of detection. So you don't see something, you, you know, we, we call that sort of dropouts, you don't see it. But there's also true biological variability that's due to cells are on and off. And you don't see that in a block experiment because you average things. So when you average it, the zeros will disappear basically. Regarding your cells, yeah. you could do the analysis pre and post of progression if you had access to them. Yes. Uh, are you tested simulated tumor cells? No, we haven't done that, no. And would it be possible? I think it would be. I mean, the, the, the only hard part there is that they are extremely rare, so you would need to enrich for those, right? Because if you just take a blood sample, you won't see them, presumably, right? So you would need to enrich for, and, and people are doing that. I mean, I think there's been a couple of papers published on circul circulating tumor cells. So if you, if you enrich or if you obtain some of your cells, you would be able to... Absolutely, yeah, yeah, that's not a problem. Yeah, I mean, the new body, they actually ignored it. They didn't model it. I mean, they used things that ignore bimodality, which, again, it's not necessarily great, but I don't think that was the main limitation of what they've, did, uh, they've done. I mean, I think it was really due to the poor experimental design. And, I mean, there was a lot of things. And I really, I mean, I'm a good friend with one of the senior authors on the paper, and, and, and the way we've done it, which is not necessarily the way we, everybody would do it, is that I didn't say, you're wrong, and, you know, we've sort of emailed them and be like, yeah, by the way, we've looked at your paper. It doesn't seem to agree. We had a couple of phone calls. So it was very constructive. But it's clear they were, they, there was a lot of things that were wrong in the analysis. So if you look at two different regions, they can differ, right? And if you look at the it's on and off, but the analysis yeah, Great question. Yeah, so I skipped over all the statistical model stuff because I didn't want to put too many equations. But this is exactly what we've done originally. We say, OK, now that you see a change, it could be driven by two different things. You see more cells that express that gene, or you say you have the same amount of cells, but you get more of that gene, right? So we're, this is exactly the novelty of what we've done, is combining these two things. So when we test for differential expression, we're testing for either a change in the frequency of the cells that express the gene, or for the amount of expression of that gene among the cells that express the gene. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, so um, I, I think the short answer is yes. Um, and I, I, I mean, it, it all it relates to the expression, right? The amount of expression of a given gene. If you have genes that are highly expressed, think of cell cycle genes, for example, then they would tend to be less by model because they are, you know, you need them most of the time. You know, they are more highly expressed. Um, and also, because they are more highly expressed, they are probably less um, um, affected by the technical aspect of bimodality because they will never fall below that threshold. But I do think most genes have a form of bimodality that's biological. So I realize I didn't answer your question at all. <laughs> but uh, but I, I do think there's bimodality in all genes. Some genes will have sort of higher frequency of bimodality just because they have sort of lower expression values. 
Yeah, I haven't done that. I think people have started, have started to look at that because now you can actually get, you know, because when you look at RNA, you only need the RNA, so you can look at the DNA, and people have studied to link the two. It's kind of tricky because there's lots of biases among these things. You know, for example, they've studied to look at allelic biases and, and things. Um, but you could do that, and I bet there might be some papers that have done that already. Um, but that would be interesting because, yeah, that, that might directly affect the expression. So, where they, so what is your question? Were, were they CD8 specific T cells? Yeah, the T cell identity because they have cellular response, right? Yes, so there's cellular responses. So, in, in the, the first vaccine that I've shown, the, the RB144, which has the 30% efficacy, we detected you know, significant CD4 response, virtually no CD8. Um, this might be a limitation of because of the functions we've looked at. It's possible that they were CD8, but they were just not detected because maybe they have different functions. I think it's unlikely, but it's possible. Um, but obviously, we know it's not enough, right? Because HIV vaccines have had, you know, cellular response for years, but none of them have been protective so far. That I, we give more weights to the cells that can co-produce multiple cytokines at once. So if you have a subset that makes five function, then we're going to say, we're not just going to count it as one, we're going to count it as five. Because we think five function is better, more function is better. So more weight to more function. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Great talk. Taylor. Thank Mitch. you. Um, nice uh, to meet you. Dr.